Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here at TreadAthletics.com. Today we're going to be breaking down Blake Snell's mechanics. Uh, obviously super fun pitcher to watch. Uh, just finished up uh, the World Series. Uh, I'm not going to get into the controversy on that, so don't even ask me. Um, but for now, let's go through some quick facts, and then we're going to get into what he does so well mechanically that allows him to throw uh, mid to upper 90s. So with that being said, let's get into the video. So first, let's start with some quick facts about Blake. He's listed at 6'4", 225. He's 27 years old. He debuted in 2016. Uh, he was a first rounder out of high school in 2011. Uh, I think he was listed at 6'4", 170 in high school. Um, so he's put on quite a bit of weight since then. Uh, in 2018, obviously, he was a Cy Young Award winner. Uh, his pitches, we all know, we're familiar with them. They're pretty nasty. His four seams averaging 95.5. Uh, he throws it about half the time. Curveball, changeup, and slider, he's kind of mixing those roughly equivalently 17%, 20% and 17% for the slider, respectively. He's throwing the curveball, averaging around 80, 88.5 with the changeup, 88.5 with the slider. Uh, none of the spin rates really jump off the table uh, at you. Uh, 2400 RPM for the four seam, 2445 with the curveball, 1740 with the changeup, 2463 with the slider. Obviously, just watching him throw, watching how these pitches move, uh, tells a little bit different of a story. So um, I don't really want to focus too much on that. Let's get into mechanically some of the things that he's doing uh, so well that allow him to create this type of velocity, allow him to sustain that velocity uh, deep into starts, deep into the season, and see if we can't identify a few of these factors. So the first variable that I want to talk about is actually his foot position. Now, uh, this is something that he made a pretty major change to his mechanics between 2017 and 2018 season and it's notable because he went from 94.7 miles an hour to 96.5 miles per hour between those two years so he, almost a two mile an hour gain which is you know again almost unheard of by the time you're a big league starter very interesting that he was able to gain almost two miles an hour you know he claims that it wasn't from this tweak uh, a lot of uh, a lot of writers have kind of uh, hypothesized that this was from moving all the way from the third base side of the rubber to the center of the rubber. Um, but if we look at a more recent clip, again, you'll see that that foot position starting right in the center of the rubber, which then if we let the clip play and we look at how that affects the directionality of the throw relative to the target, we can see that he's landing relatively in line with that back foot, relatively uh, good direction towards the target. He might be landing a couple inches close. He's a few degrees close with that front foot being able to uh, rotate around and throw around that front foot. Um, but let's kind of contrast that to this clip from 2016. And what you'll see is that he's starting almost entirely off the rubber on the third base side, which again, in and of itself, uh, it wouldn't seem to be that big of a deal, but if we look at kind of the, the chain reaction that happens downstream, as he actually gets into his lower half, you can see that there's a little bit of a forward shift onto the toes. So I'm gonna play that again. As soon as he actually gets into right there, you can see the heel comes off slightly off the ground. Maybe we can zoom in on that. The heel comes off slightly and his weight starts to shift forward towards the toes. If we look at the ensuing directionality of the throw, he's landing about a foot more closed than he is currently based upon that starting position on the rubber. Now, again, this isn't necessarily a problem in and of itself. We have a lot of athletes that do well striding a little bit cross body and it actually works well for them. So we'll get into that more in a second. But what this does mean is that if your directionality is taking you more closed, then in order to compensate for that and get your throw back online, now he's really got to pull around that closed front leg. So instead of keeping everything straight onto the target and rotating through, he's striding very cross body. And now to get back to his release point, he's got to kind of overcompensate and yank his, yank his upper half around and get back online. Traditionally debated topic amongst pitching coaches is, you know, is this an issue that needs to be addressed fundamentally? Uh, do we need to fix a pitcher that strides cross body? And the answer is it kind of depends. It depends if it's working for that guy. Um, now he claims that this change was more for consistency. I've got a quote for him here. He just said, quote, everything got more consistent moving to the left. I uh, stayed consistent with my running and working out. That's what I'd attribute my velo staying up a couple of ticks too. So he says that this was more about consistency. His walk rate uh, did go significantly down that next year. But the point is that when we have an athlete who kind of naturally strides cross body and it's working for them, it's not necessarily the first thing that we're gonna go to change uh, because it can work very 
very well. Jake Arietta is, is kind of a prime example of how you want to be careful with messing with a guy's uh, direction to his throw. It can backfire. Um, when he was with the Orioles, obviously they were really trying to get him away from striding cross body. You know, then as soon as he left the Orioles, uh, went with the Cubs, and they kind of let him be himself. It worked for him from a velocity standpoint. It really worked for him from a uh, deception standpoint and just an overall effectiveness standpoint. So we've seen kind of both sides to the coin, and it's just not a black and white issue like a lot of pitching coaches might make it out to be. But in his case, again, he improved his directionality by moving over on the rubber, and it did seem to significantly help his consistency. Uh, if we're dealing with a pitcher that doesn't have exceptional uh, T-spine mobility, doesn't have exceptional range through his upper body, or doesn't have exceptional range through, his, uh, through hip rotation, it's typically not going to work too well for those athletes because they're going to be striding so cross body that they're going to really have to work around that closed front side that if you don't have exceptional hip rotation and you don't have exceptional T-spine motion to get around, you're really going to be fighting a losing battle. When you have a guy with poor hip rotation and poor upper half mobility and you stride that cross body, you're typically going to see that knee bow out, you're going to see that foot kind of cave out, and you're going to see the throw break down into ball release. So it worked for him, but obviously it's working better for him now. Um, so again, just something interesting that I wanted to start the breakdown with. All right, so the next thing that I wanna break down is his leg lift. So I'm gonna look at his forward move. Obviously there's a heavy drift or a heavy initial forward weight shift. Um, if you've been following this channel for any amount of time, you're familiar with this concept of the drift. I'm gonna summarize it again anyway, for those of you who might not be familiar with it. So as he gets into his lower half, what you'll often see with hard throwers when you look at the side view is that there's an aggressive forward move of the center of mass. So if we kind of contrast this to this typical idea of a balance point, right? If he was coming to a balance point, he'd just be lifting that knee straight up. What he's actually doing is he has a very, very aggressive forward shift. And so he's bringing his belly button forwards. He's shifting forwards. Um, again, that's, that's what we call the drift. That's not necessarily unique to him. Um, but what is interesting, what I do want to highlight about his forward move is something a little bit more subtle. I want to look at kind of this initial dipping of that front shoulder that, you know, we do commonly see this as a little bit of a timing mechanism or maybe it's a sequencing mechanism in a lot of hard throwers. This is by no means a, a hard and fast rule with hard throwers. But what I mean by the dip is that as he gets into his, his drift, his forward move, he gets a little bit of a downhill tilt to his shoulders. So there's a little bit of a, a downhill tilt. What might be going on in our experience with coaching athletes is that this dip, or sometimes it'll be kind of a chin tuck. We'll put Roger Clemens up as an example of this as well. Sometimes it's just a chin tuck. Sometimes it's a little bit of a dip of the shoulders as they go through their forward move. Um, it seems to help guys stay more downhill or more level with their shoulders during the ensuing uh, linear move. In other words, adding a little bit of a forward dip helps their shoulders stay more level during the forward move whereas if their first move is to just tip the pelvis uphill and keep the shoulders a little bit more level then as they get into their backside they end up going even more uphill so this could potentially be a mechanism for him again he's a little bit downhill with his shoulders here as he gets into his actual lower half that could be one of those things that allows him to stay more level with his shoulders because of that initial uh, forward move. So again, it's something to play with. If you're struggling to, by getting very uphill at landing, that's something you can play with during your forward move is just add a little bit of a chin tuck, add a little bit of a dipping of the shoulders and just see it, play with that for a session, see how that feels. But you could very well find that it helps you stay downhill better because of the downhill chain reaction that occurs during your linear move. And the next thing uh, about his leg lift is just maintaining posture. I talk about this a lot, um, but by maintaining posture, we're really looking at okay, where is the center of mass? Where is the upper half relative to the back foot? So if we look at him from a front or back view, he's doing a good job of keeping tall and stacked over the midfoot. And so what we don't wanna see is that the leg lift takes you onto your toes or that you're excessively leaning back. He's doing a good job, he's staying stacked. We have a little bit of that posterior tilt action of the pelvis where he's tall, he's stacked, and that pelvis is tucking underneath him just a little bit. So all in all, Good leg lift, good forward move, and he's got an interesting timing mechanism that we frequently see with hard throwers as well. So let's take a look at his linear move now. As he transitions from the drift into his backside, we can see that he does a really good job of getting into that back leg from that initial forward move. So during that initial leg lift, I like to think of it as kind of like floating. You're floating through the drift. There's not really a ton of load happening through the glute. There's not really a coiling or a hinge happening during the initial forward move. But as he transitions out of that, 
right there is when he, he drops into the glute. And so I like to think of this transition as kind of like a seesaw, right? We can all imagine a seesaw happening. The drift, again, especially in his case, because he has that little bit of a dip, the drift takes you forward. There's no load through the back leg or relatively minimal uh, activation of the back glute during that forward move. And so you can think of that as kind of the first part of the seesaw. As he gets into his back leg, he transitions into this hinge. And from here, he's in a very stable position on the back leg. So his back leg is underneath him. He's accepting load through that glute. And this back foot is stable. You'll frequently see this in lower level athletes where they don't do a good job of maintaining uh, that stability on the back foot. And that back foot is kind of wobbling over the place or it has this tendency to want to shoot out backwards towards second base, uh, or maybe the heel comes off the ground a little bit early. So he's doing a good job of maintaining this strong anchor on the back leg as he guides his center of mass forward. As he, again, moves down the mound, moves through that linear move, the other thing that we constantly talk about is the action of that back foot. Now, watch what happens on the back foot. Does it pivot or does it turn over? This right here is a very telling frame because you can see that, that foot has fully turned over into eversion versus pivoting and popping up and over or pushing off like an ankle kick or pushing off with his quad. He's not jumping into landing. He's not jumping into triple extension. Rather, he's holding the ground. He's holding tension. He's building tension as he moves forward. And because he's trying to maintain tension, trying to maintain tension, trying to maintain tension, and then he lets the pelvis unload, what happens is this, the back foot is turned over into eversion at the last second, and then everything begins to spiral its way up the chain. So again, just very, uh, very important but subtle uh, detail that you guys need to be aware of. Again, this does require an adequate level of ankle mobility. Um, those of you who have watched our videos before, we've kind of harped against uh, you know, wearing ankle braces or maybe wearing like high top cleats because it really in inhibits your back, uh, backside from working properly. You, you really can't, uh, you can't effectively use that first domino uh, effectively to, to stay into the backside. And so guys with high top cleats, I, again, I'm guilty of this myself. I had a, a history of a couple ankle sprains. I just threw an ankle brace on it, threw high top cleats on it, and didn't realize that I was just being forced to pop up and out of my backside early. It might only be a one or two mile an hour difference, um, but it's also a consistency difference because you no longer have the ability to hold the ground as long as possible. So again, just something that I wanted to point out there is the action of the back ankle into landing. All right, so the next point that I wanna make is uh, taking a look at his arm action. With Blake Snell, he's an example that we use all the time with our athletes uh, when we talk about arm action because he gets into su such deep and efficient positions within his upper half. Again, he's not necessarily the most uh, physical specimen. He's got, he's got long levers, you know, 6'4", 225, but he's not known as being a physical specimen. Um, so how does he sit, you know, 95, 96, throw 97, 98, whenever he wants? Uh, one of the ways that he's able to do that is by capturing momentum and efficiency within his arm action so well. So we take a look at his arm path as he breaks his hands, as he swings that ball up and around, He does what we call capturing the pendulum or capturing that momentum from handbrake very, very efficiently. In other words, that loop of energy from a handbrake down into the arm spiral, down into the flip up right here, there are no lags, no hitches. It's a seamless movement. He doesn't get down here, pause, stop, then hike up. He doesn't get to that, that flip up position, pause, then accelerate. It's one seamless loop of energy from handbrake all the way into ball acceleration. Again, we can kind of see that visually here from handbrake to flip up. There's not a single frame in this entire slow-mo where he's lagging, where there are any hitches. It does that exact arm spiral that we talk about consistently. And more importantly, as he gets into that flip up position, look at that degree of scap retraction, horizontal abduction. Look at this flip up position that we like to talk about. Ideally, we're looking for daylight between the head and between the forearm. We're looking for that forearm to be vertical at landing and daylight behind the head. Now, to get into this position takes pretty, uh, pretty significant level of mobility. Um, specifically, we're looking at the ability to retract the scapula, horizontal abduction at the humerus. Uh, to do this, you need significant uh, mobility through your pecs. You also need mobility through T-spine extension. So we're gonna do another video on that coming up soon uh, as far as how to improve scap retraction, how to improve layback, how to open up your chest. We've done a couple of videos on this. To get into this position is so crucial because not only is the arm up with good timing, 
but from this position, now you can apply force to the baseball over a longer arc of motion. How long can he apply force to the baseball? Well, because he's so far back into scap loading and retraction at landing, he's able to apply force to the baseball over a very long arc, all the way from ball release to that position of scap retraction. So from back here, all the way into ball release. There's a long arc of motion over which he can apply force to the baseball. If we just made a couple modifications, let's say we you know, tightened up his chest a little bit. Let's say instead of his forearm being back here at landing, let's say it was right here. Let's say by landing he was already beginning to open up and his arm was here instead of all the way back. Well, he's not gonna apply force to the baseball over as long of an arc of motion and all else being equal, he's gonna throw significantly slower. So this is a key component to being able to recreate uh, and sustain your velocity deep into games. When you see a pitcher who can just effortlessly sustain his velocity uh, deep into games, deep into the season, uh, you know that he's creating that velocity, at least in part from high degrees of mechanical efficiency. Athletes that uh, tend to maybe throw the hardest in the first inning or maybe they're a reliever where they can only kind of uh, fizzle out after an inning or two. A lot of times those are guys who are creating their velocity from uh, kind of brute forcing that velocity and active muscular effort. When you create your velocity from extremely efficient positions and extremely efficient energy transfer, it's significantly more sustainable uh, how you're actually creating that velocity. So again, arm action, one of those things that he does extremely well. If we look at his glove arm for a second, he's a good example of that glove arm sinking into the plane of rotation. So as soon as his glove arm gets to right about here, right, what does it do at this point? Does it aggressively pull off to the side? Is he aggressively rolling it down to his side? Is that glove arm just sinking into the plane of rotation, locking to the torso and rotating together? So let's look at what's happening. So at this point, that glove arm is locked to the torso and it's locking in plane with the torso rotation. Um, this is an important component because a lot of coaches will kind of cue an aggressive, uh, aggressive pulling of the glove arm or an aggressive rowing of the glove arm down to the hip. Um, what we coach and teach with most of our athletes is basically you want to feel tension, find tension in the glove arm, and then as that glove arm unloads, it sinks into the plane of the torso rotation. So my torso is rotating about kind of a three-quarter axis the glove arm should be sinking into that plane. If I'm rotating on more of a transverse axis, the glove arm should be sinking into that same plane. But it's not aggressively leading the way. And that's not how we coach it or how we cue it for most of our athletes. And again, Blake Snell is a good example of that in action with the glove arm sinking into that plane of rotation. All right, so the final thing that I want to touch on is the action of his, uh, his lower half and specifically his front leg as he unloads his pelvis into landing. So what you'll often see with athletes is that this front leg has a tendency to want to basically just disconnect from that linear move, that hinge, and just swing and open up. So we kind of refer to that as swinging the gate with the front leg. Snell is a good example of not doing that. So what you see is that as he's loading, he's not just loaded over his back hip, holding tension in his back hip. There's actually a load into internal rotation on the front hip as well. So we can see this from the front. We can see this internal rotation angle right here. One way of thinking about it uh, that Paul Nyman used to talk about is Keeping, that, keeping the cleats or keeping the bottom of the foot facing the target as long as possible. Now, while I don't think that cue is necessarily appropriate for everybody, you can see that in Blake Snell. He's holding this internal rotation tension on the lead leg. And he does that as long as he possibly can into landing. It's not like he gets halfway through his linear move and then he opens up and starts to reach and swing the gate. He's holding that as long as he possibly can one to two frames before landing, he's still holding that. You can still see this angle on the lead leg. And so he's trying to maintain tension in both hips into landing. Now we like to refer to this as the back hip, or sometimes we'll explain it this way, as the back hip opens the front hip. The front hip doesn't reach and lead the way. The front hip holds tension, the pelvis holds tension. You're staying locked and loaded as you move forward until the pelvis goes and the action of the pelvis unloading into the front hip then opens the front leg. His lead leg, again, is being opened by the action of the pelvis, but it's trying to hold tension uh, as long as it can. Again, you can see in this position right here, there's a huge amount of torque being created. The, the back hip has already gone. The front hip is trying to hold tension even though the back hip has already begun to rotate. Uh, this is a very common energy leak in, in lower halves is that Athletes just, they think they're maintaining tension, but they really kind of come out of it too early and that front leg starts to reach and leak early. So he rides the linear move forward, he's into his backside, 
he's holding tension in the front hip as well. Back hip starts to go, front hip is still holding tension, and again, the back hip opens up the front hip. Reframing in your mind how you think about uh, the action of the pelvis unloading um, can have a, a play an important role in the efficiency of your patterns and just how you conceptualize your mechanics. Um, it also helps contribute towards having a little bit more of a backside driven lower half versus a front side leaking or reaching lower half. So uh, again, just important consideration. Leave a comment down below if you have any questions about that specific concept. Guys, thanks for watching this breakdown. If you're not already subscribed to our channel, go ahead, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and we'll see you in the next video.